Buongiorno. In la concession anarchica del vivente, I give many arguments in favor of stochastic disorder and against essentialistic order in biology. I will give only three arguments now. First argument, in fact, there is not a single biological parameter that is not subject to random variability. If there is a field in which random variability is omnipresent, it is biology. But instead of recognizing random variability as the primary property of life, biologists have reduced it to, parasit to parasitic noise, to a small margin of fluctuation in the functioning of living beings that are seen as machines. Second, naturalists have always wanted to see order in living things, and they have tried to classify them, to put them in these little boxes called species. But despite all their effort, there is no definitive definition of species accepted by all biologists. There are always many exceptions to all these definitions. Living beings don't like to be put in boxes. And third, it is now experimentally, experimentally demonstrated that proteins, the fundamental constituents of living beings, are not made according to the orders of a genetic program, but through a probabilistic process. There is always random variability between cells. Two cells are never alike, even strictly alike, even if they belong to the same type. Take, taking into account the stochastic disorder of life, of life implies a new synthesis in biology. In the framework of this synthesis, the Dow of this new synthesis, the Darwinian principles apply to the internal functioning of living beings. For Darwin, variation creates a diversity of beings among which some will multiply because they are better able to interact with their environment. The same principles apply in the cellular societies that constitute us. Cells vary spontaneously, and notably thanks through prob this probabilistic protein synthesis, and this allows them to adapt to their internal environment, which is constituted by the other cells within the same living being. It is on the basis of this local behavior through a decentralized process that a multicellular living being is built and not according to a global program written in the genome. This theory, named ontophylogenesis, is an extension of the Darwinian theory of evolution to ontogenesis. It allows experimental predictions that have actually been verified. And this completely destroys the current genetic, genetic program theory. This theory has also important political consequences. Indeed, according to it, the primary entity of life is the genealogy genealogical line. 
is to say the flow of life from which the species and the individual are subjectively abstracted. This implies a de-essentialization of these notions and of that of race with a double consequence. Within human population, populations, if we recognize that races are subjective abstractions and that what is real is a genealogical link that unites us, racism is, racism is not possible. But the same is true for our relationship with the rest of the biosphere. Man with a capital M falls off his pedestal. Man no longer exists as an objective species possessing properties that would irremediably separate him from the rest of the living world and make him superior. Humans are reintegrated into the co community of living beings. It is obvious, obvious that from then on, we are obliged to reconsider our relationship with nature. We must accept that we are not its masters, but participants as are all other living forms. The other important aspect of this theory is that living beings exist only in their relationship with their environment, which implies mutual dependencies of all with all and not a war of all against all as suggested by the reactionary caricature of Darwinism. In contrast, to ontophilogenesis, to this new synthesis, to this new theory, Ma mainstream biology, which is domi dominated by genetics, justifies the anthropocentric system that is destroying our planet. Its essentialistic ontology justifies the separation of living beings into pseudo-objective species. It is a sort of apartheid extended to the whole biosphere. <coughs> Once you have separated beings, of course, you also create a hierarchy between them with man at the top, who is entitled to exploit the rest of nature for its own good with all its destructive consequences. In my book, I also explain how, in fact, genetics has been refuted, refuted since the beginning of the 20th century, but that instead of being discarded, discarded it continues to exist as an ideology. This ideology says that everyone is what he or she is because is or her genes. So it provides a pseudo-scientific justification for the social order by explaining that it is natural. Everyone is in his or her place and nothing is wrong with that since it is written in the DNA. Geneticists will tell you that this is a caricature of what they really think. That of course, they know that things are more complicated, that the environment modulates the effect of genes, but there are also epigenetic factors and so on. But this is a double discourse making genetics irrefutable. On the one hand, genetics relies on very precise laws the so-called Mendel laws, which state that genes alone determine the characteristics of a living being, and that if you know which genes an individual has, you can predict, you can predict its characteristics. And on the other hand, there exists this softer version of genetics, often called epigenetics today, 
that calls upon the action of the environment. Geneticists continually switched, switched from one discourse to the other, depending on the circumstances, depending on the circumstances. This is why genetics is not a scientific theory, but an ideological discourse. Of course, geneticists will say that I am mixing science and politics, which should remain separate. But biology is already infested with authoritarian and hierarchical metaphors. It is said that cells follow the program, receive, receive instructions that tell them what to do. The nucleus of cells is compared to a common center that directs the enzymes of the metabolisms, metabolisms which are themselves compared to workers, etc., etc. And no one finds anything to say about it. It is not politics. But if on the basis of serious scientific grounds, you introduce anti-authoritarian metaphors, the same people will criticize you. They will say that you are doing politics instead of science. Well, I assume that I do politics. I think that scientists cannot abstract themselves from the society in which they live and that the society influences their imagination and thus their praxis. Beyond politics, my, books, my book has also philosophical consequences. In it, I show that contemporary biology is essentialist. According to essentialism, the diversity of things will only be apparent the world would be structured from fixed entities serving as stereotypes for the genesis of things. These are, for example, the ideas of Plato or the Aristotelian forms. The genome of today's biology is a modern equivalent of an Aristotelian form. According to biologists, the genome is a blueprint. All human beings would be alike because they would have a common blueprint encoded in the genome, the so-called genetic program. Aristotle's biology worked exactly according to this pattern, except that what we call genome, he called it the form or the soul. In contrast to this essentialist ontology, as early as antiquity, Heraclitus began, be, began to develop an ontology which, instead of reducing the variability of things, recognized it as a primary property. His famous saying, you can never bathe in the same river twice, is well known. It is a little less known, but he also maintained that the most beautiful arrangement is like a heap of garbage gathered at random. Well, biology needs such an Heraclitian ontology that accepts random variation as the prim primary property of life. To conclude, I will say a few words about the current pandemic. Coronavirus, the coronavirus is a vivid demonstration of what I have been saying about species. First of all, the so-called species barrier has been exploded. Here is a virus that was supposed to replicate in a specific animal but that obviously did not care about our classifications and refused to say in his box. It wandered through several intermediate groups before in infecting us. Then there are all these variants that cause us such fear. This is 
in fact, a demonstration of the ubiquity of variation. Viruses vary in the same way that, that we do. Without this variation, we would not have been able to adapt and we would have disappeared long ago in the course of evolution. Viruses do the same. It is true that we can create conditions that favor the emergence of the pandemic. But fundamentally, it is the result of variation. I will say a last word to finish. Of course, what I have been saying is not contradictory to the current vaccination campaign. I have had my free shots and I advise everyone to do the same. <laughs>